Let us get back on the same page. Let me ask you, all of you, if you have any major issues other than private ones, which are not for this forum. Is there anything that you want to share with the class? This is a moment. Can we ask homework questions? Um, yeah. Or I guess problem one, problem two also, but problem one, we have to calculate this X2 value that we talked about last class. Um, but I don't personally know, like what, what's a good X2 value? How do we know if our X2 value is good? This is what you're talking about. Yeah. We all sets of n numbers from probability, blah, blah, blah. You may want to use random. Yes, for each set, make a histogram. Yes, perform a one-sided t-test as described both from them being drawn from the respective known distribution. So let me go to this here. I sort of want to say, isn't that what we talked about last time? Yes, it is. So if you do one experiment and you draw a hundred Fisher distributed values and you compare them with the predictions that you make on a student distribution, which you think it might be, and you work out what for this one experiment, your one X square is, you have one value of it. And here, most people would stop who would say, okay, here's my value, boom. And given that I'm testing whether my hypothesis holds and the variable that I have chosen that whose distribution I pretend to know is x squared. I can immediately do one test for goodness and say, you all, this is what I expect. And this is the value I have. I want to say that that particular value that I've drawn is likely if everything checks out, if everything is true as advertised, because it is, even, it is with substantial probability likely to be even larger than that. If you think of X square as a discrepancy, which I'm now going to add as a word and like it, how about I, I add it here, then this discrepancy is neither large nor small, or rather, we can't make any sense of whether it's large or small only by comparing it with what we expect it to be. And if everything checks out, again, if your hypothesis that you're testing is true and your statistic is a fair test for it, then this value of how likely you have to have this particular value or even worse, because a big discrepancy is going to be you know, worse. And on this side, on the left side, it's sort of more goodly. And here it's sort of like, as usual, all with air quotes. Okay, so you do this one test, you calculate this one number, you think everything checks out, you calculate the, what, the gray area, and you're saying, look, that's very likely I accept it. That's the answer to the question, how good is good enough? Well, it's the probability. If the probability of being even worse is still large, you accept your hypothesis. So in order for you all not to do this thing blindly, I say, you don't even have to trust Pearson that this particular X squared actually is chi squared distributed. You might wanna find out for yourself. How better than to find for yourself is to pretend you're gonna do this experiment a hundred times drawing a hundred balls out of one distribution and testing them with another. And you build your own histogram of what that thing should be. If that own histogram that you build looks like chi squared with the right number of variables, then chances are you're on the same page as Pearson who developed the test. And then you have 
firsthand evidence of what it means to be testing and what it means to be likely because you're literally testing the test by drawing a histogram of the sampling distribution, which we claim is chi-square, but I am telling you, if you're not doing it really right, it's not gonna always be pretty. So now you're doing your test of your test and you build your own histogram of what you think should be a chi-square distribution. Or rather, I say you should think it's a chi-square distribution because some dude in 1870, taking time out of his busy schedule, worked this out for some idealized cases and we've been using it ever since. So now you have a way using MATLAB, computational methods of drawing your own observed sampling distribution for this. And here I'm drawing the case where it's pretty good, but if you take values, M values from distribution A, and you bin them in K bins, and you compare them with distribution B, with P parameters, including the extra constraint, and it's not really all working out for you, and you simply calculate the X squared for those 100 tests and make a histogram of that, and then if the chi-square distribution that we claim it is, doesn't actually follow it, then if you're only doing one test and using the theorized curve to do the test for goodness of fit, you are going to be wrong more often or less often than you should be for you to interpret your test. So if I say I'm doing the test only once and I will cut it off at 95%, which means it has to be, if, if my X squared, if my discrepancy is any worse than that, beyond which there is still 5% likelihood of finding that sort of a large discrepancy under the model being true, then I reject it. In the ideal case, when everything does check out, which is the easy, 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 good size bins and so on test, then you're going to then need to see that you reject your model 95%, uh, uh, only 5% of the times when in fact it is right. That's the alpha or one minus alpha percent significance level of this test. So that's why I say do problem one is the easy one. Make sure that it's sort of definitely better work like a Gaussian with another Gaussian with a good size number and a good size bin and everything sort of according to the recipe book. Then you build your distribution. I'm gonna guess it's gonna look like the one that is theorized. And if you use a theorized one for the rejection or acceptance of your hypothesis, then you know exactly if you're testing at 95% confidence that you should still reject 5% even though they should not have been rejected. Then you do the, the test a hundred times and you see, ah, oh, yeah, you know, I was expecting 4% and really I'm getting 3% or 7%. But in problem two, if you take some outlandish distribution and you test it against some other outlandish distribution, which is a state of, I don't know what's going on, and you reach for the test, which is, you know, the textbook recipe example, and you're using the test by the book and you're saying, I'm going to do the 95% and I should, then you should expect 5% rejection, even though you shouldn't have. If that number is very different, it's probably because the underlying theorized distribution of the discrepancy is not what it's advertised to be. And then by running your own experiment a hundred times and drawing the green histogram, you'll see, aha, that is why I don't get what I expect in terms of failure or rejection rate, because my test wasn't good. I think I said everything right. I think it came out the way I wanted it to say. But ask follow-up questions, because if there's one thing that you all need from this class, it is to understand the concept of a hypothesis test. And this is it. Like, if you get this, you can safely quit school, although I should recommend you to stay in school. But that is a huge thing. So this is a sampling distribution in green of the X square statistic as advertised, which we think is chi-square because Pearson said so. Incidentally, Pearson was a professor of statistics at University College of London, where I once worked, and I had an office in the Pearson building. I think they since renamed it because he also did a lot of work on measuring human head shape and trying to further the human race with ideal head shapes. But they were all doing it at the time, so he was in bad company. So somebody pick up on this and ask me a follow-up question.
it either has to be crystal clear and then you just need to do it. And chances are it will become crystal clear as you are doing it. But if there are loose ends, it's a good time to clean them up. Okay, I have a question. So when you say you make histogram, what distribution are you talking about? Are you talking about the distribution of the n numbers? No. Or well, that you do too, right? Okay. The blue histogram on this graph, that is one experiment. That leads to, oh, why have I already wrote it here? That leads to one X. That leads to one rejection or not. You get 100 Gaussians, you claim it's Gaussian, you check it out, the X square is 37. You know that's good because you expect 38. It's 50% likely to be even worse. And you say, check, that checks. Then you do that experiment a hundred times. So we're getting like a bunch of X squareds. And you're getting indeed that a sampling distribution of the test statistic. That is a uh, hundred experiments run. And so normally, when you're doing cookbook statistics, you don't do that. You're just saying chi-square test, histogram, bin, Pearson, check, done. Hi, Frederick. Does it mean we need to uh, set 100 data, sampling data when we do 100 uh, test? Well, my, my, um, my 100 is, is, you know, in biblical language, it would be 12 times 12, you know, a lot, okay? It's metaphoric for a lot. Yeah, uh, if we so, just do 10, uh, 10 tests, do we need to set 10 different sampling data? I mean. If I say the green 100 times, I mean, you would indeed do 100 times an experiment of 100 data. So there are two histograms on this page. One is the thing that you're actually trying to do, which is to ascertain whether your first and single experiment of 100 data is looking like the theorized red distribution. I'm saying, well, make a histogram and plot the probabilities and calculate x squared. I am claiming that if you do that, that x squared has a chi-squared distribution, which means if you want to generate 100 x squares, you need to do this experiment 100 times, generating 100 data and calculating 100 x squares and graphing its histogram, which is in green. That, I theorize, is the black distribution. If you don't do this, but you're just testing for x, you take it on faith that x squared is distributed as chi squared. That's no good way of doing anything. So you test it. And what better way to test is to just randomize it again. And the variables here at play are, what is this 100? What is it, n total, n data points? And I'll do m tests. You do m test of the same n numbers with the same k bins for the same distribution to try to get the sampling distribution. You want to call the same function many times. So in MATLAB speak, by the way, this is called SPMD. I don't think you have to go there, but let me briefly share the screen. Just so you hear it here first. If you have a parallel machine, which at this point everyone has, you usually have two processors per whatever little thing you have. And then if you're, you're going to do the same thing multiple times, you know, there is a thing for it. It's an undocumented built-in. That's crazy. Really? That is not the way things used to be. They must have... Okay, so that's crazy that it doesn't have a help, but single program, multiple data. Just I just want to mention the... That's crazy. That is not the way it is undocumented they must have renamed it in your version because in my older version of matlab i surely do have it okay you don't need it i'm going to show you another example which you can find on my uh web page so while i look for what i will bring up think about if you have 
internalized this here. So the thing that I didn't talk about was confidence intervals. And I said, you all do that on your own. And let me quickly get to this point. So now I'm giving you more access to the sausage making than I usually do, right? So what am I doing? I'm getting my own code in my laptop, which is that blazing hot machine that takes 10 minutes to run anything. So now I have what I wanted to show, norm test. You can find this, in other words, on my GitHub page. I wrote the world's simplest implementation of testing the test. So norm test tests whether a particular value, one single value, is derived from a hypothesized normal distribution with a known mean that you think it is and a variance that you try, and it rejects it if the probability of being more extreme than the observed values is very unlikely below some confidence interval. This is the test they teach you in intro statistics. And in fact, this is the test that uh, I, I write down in the notes that I handed out that I didn't cover it very much. Okay, it's a one sample test. So my little n, my big n is one, but I'm testing the test a hundred times, as many times as I want. So quite literally one sample of one point each, okay? Very different from MATLAB's Z test, which is saying, I have 50 numbers, are they Gaussian? And if so, what mean and variance do they have? Here in this implementation, I'm saying, I have one number. Does it come out of a Gaussian with this mean and this variance? That's arguably the simplest thing you could do. Three, does three come out of a distribution with mean zero and standard deviation two? Maybe, well, you calculate the probability of this being true based on evaluating how likely it is to get three or even bigger numbers or negative three or even smaller numbers. That's a two-sided Gaussian test. And then if it's really still pretty much likely, you're saying yes. So all the hypotheses are then built upon the fact that you're saying I draw seven numbers, three, four, negative two, and negative five and you do a test score, which is a Z test, which is a test on their mean and the known distribution of that after subtracting the observed standard deviation. So that's in the sort of thing that I didn't explicitly cover, but that is really the first thing every statistics book does. And so you can read it in my notes. So here I'm literally saying, well, I'm just gonna make N1. I'll try one number. But in order to understand how the test work, I'm just going to do that a hundred times. So I follow the recipe book to the letter. And that's why this code is three lines long. It says, this is a test on the mean, but I got a mean of one. So I'm calculating this next line, the probability of the single test value that it is even more extreme in the absolute sense, two-sided from what you expect it to be given a known standard deviation. And then you're saying, well, look at this alpha is a certain value and the probability is tiny, you reject it. But by picking a small alpha and rejecting that your hypothesis is true, if this probability is smaller than alpha, you're going to make a mistake, alpha proportionally, alpha probability like, where you will falsely reject it. You build this in there. You pick a confidence level or a significance level, whatever the words are, you pick this alpha, a small bit of the tail in the distribution that says, look, if I draw the number infinity minus one, which we can't do, we both know that all of us, it's still not zero unlikely under the Gaussian probability distribution of zero one but it's extremely unlikely because numbers bigger than that in the absolute sense are very unlikely. Well, how unlikely 10 to the negative, you know, infinity, very, very, very unlikely. So I reject that the number 85 billion trillion is from a zero one Gaussian distribution. So in this world simplest tester of tests, I just do the standard advertised test, which you gotta, you know, you recognize it from my notes or from the book or from any other book because it literally is the simplest thing that anyone ever does. And I do this as many times as I 
try. And then I report on how many times I accepted it for the right reasons. And then I report, okay? So if everything goes well, I have my MATLAB here. Um, first, I need to add this function to my search path. In the startup, I add, go look for these things, do the startup, pretend I'm starting up. So if you're given one value, literally one data point, yeah. ask if this value is coming from a norm, normal distribution. Yeah. And you, then the decision is making based upon the probability of this value is larger or more extreme than this distribution, I get it. But yeah, if yeah. you factor, you're saying that you're making a decision based on how, how often do you get a, how often the probability of the value is more extreme. Is that so? so Not in this code. In this code, I literally do that one data point test as many times as I give elements of a vector. Yeah, but what, but, uh, but the, the final decision is made upon each data point or the percentage of oh, the whole vector. If I give it a hundred values, I do a hundred tests. I make a hundred final decisions. Every one of them is final. And oh, okay. I write this little function so that you can run it and see if you made a hundred final decisions based on this, mm -hmm. you're going to be wrong 95% of the time. Okay. So, so here is your draw. It's called X. And we're saying, well, look, if it is really Gaussian, then the probability of having this value or larger and this value or smaller having flipped it. If it's small, you're saying, ah, oh, this can't have been drawn from this distribution. So let me run this thing, right? I take a random mean, I take a random variable. I take a random integer. I make a random size of my test and I run this thing. So this is also a good anatomy of the function. You see the function is three lines long, but it is the documentation is longer than what the function actually does. And it includes an example and the example has random inputs. A random number tested against a random Gaussian with a random variance at a random confidence level and a random number of times. Okay, so norm test, 12% at the 13% confidence is rejected for this mean and this variance. Run this a number of times. Is this test any good? Yes, it is. Because if I think I'm rejecting this at 6% for this whatever mean and variance it is, I'm running 754 cases to convince myself that I rejected 5%. Well, that's, so I'm looking now, the table that I asked you to build for the chi-square test, which is just, you know, a little bit more complicated, is to compare these numbers. Look, if I'm asking for a 17% confidence level for this particular mean and variance, and I do 150 times that test, then I'm rejecting 25%. That's the, that's the wiggle room in the testing of the test. If I conducted 150 patients, and based on every one patient, I made a decision whether they had the swine flu, which is apparently a really deadly contagious disease or not, then I expect to be right the number of times that my test is supposed to be right at. This is telling me that if I do this 150 times, it's 70% that I'm getting 25, and so there's a rate of false positive to false negative. But of course, all of us do these tests at 95 often, so, now I'm running at 95 a number of times. Am I doing it wrong? 95%. So I need to put a 0 0.95. Look, now I'm running this test 20 times. Now I'm running the, the test of the test 20 times. And you're seeing that if you're saying 95% of the, you know, if you ask for 95, you're gonna get pretty much that 94, 96, 94, 95. This is a pure show of saying, if you do this thing by hand for known distributions, you know what you should be getting and you test it 
That's exactly what you're getting. That's uh, apparently breaking down a little bit if I ask for low confidence, because if I did this thing for, you know, 15% confidence, which is obviously a ridiculous level of confidence, well, not too bad, you know. Here, here was a case. I, you see, I'm doing, you know, I'm asking three times whether this single number comes out of this particular distribution with 15% confidence. Well, in this case, I wish to have 15% or 85% or to forget which way the numbers were rejected and I'm getting, you know, zero. So that shows you the dependence of sample size. And of course, the proper Z test, which I didn't program because MATLAB already has it, is asking you, that's a multi-sample test. That is to say, hey, I have 100 values. Do they come from a common distribution? That only results in one test and in one decision. But you'll see it is, um, well, it's all hidden behind, but you got to follow it up what, what it actually is doing. But um, you can write it. It's, it's a standard confidence test for numbers being drawn from the distribution by looking at their standard deviation and their mean according to the distribution that I work out briefly in the notes and which is also in the Ben Nathan Pearson book. Norm test. And then you have in MATLAB, you have pre programmed things like bar test, which is a test on the variance. One sample, but multiple data points. And you have a Z test for the Z scores and so on. But you'd have to read it. And I'd rather have you read how norm test works and then realize that your homework is something like this get numbered, ask for a confidence level, reject it if it doesn't pass and then see how well you do. And the additional thing here is that by seeing how well you do, you can make a table like I did in, in this one. I run it so many times and then that's the result, right? With this little function here, if this was your homework, you could sketch out a table of N, the number of times you, you know, N is one, M is 486. And here you'd report the proportion that you're doing as you think you should be doing for particular distributions. And then the additional thing is that, well, I could also, what, the, what comes out out of norm tests, which is really just my example, PV, PF, P alpha, zero. So this is the, the, the passing and failing. So A is a vector, right? These are all single tests. PR is the P value, that's B now. And C, the third output is PR, that's the percentage, in this case, all of them test. And I expected A, B, C, A, L. In fact, I had 100. All right. Oh, so, and so then the, the only additional thing is that this particular code here, because it is only three lines, it just calculates the P value called PB. Okay. The test statistic is not actually anything more complicated than this here. The test statistics here is it's the number itself. Because I only had one number. The only thing I have to test is what is its value. But in the chi square that you're doing, your test statistic is x squared. You're running your experiment, you're making a decision. You run your experiment many times, you make many decisions. You report how many times your decisions were right for the right reasons and wrong for the right reasons and right for the wrong reasons and wrong for the wrong reasons. And you visualize it and understand it by drawing the histogram of your test statistic, which you arrive at by making your test, conducting it a hundred times. Okay, I'm now positive I have said the same thing 14 times. But you now need to do it. I do claim that this is all you need to know about testing because, because it is. I mean, I sent you that little paper on p-values and then you can write a lot about what that means. And it means nothing. Somebody's p-value is only a useful piece of information for you if they demonstrate that it works right, which means it works right the right number of times if you have it right and then it rejects it the expected number of times if you have it wrong. So let me go back 
or rather forward. Let me give you my favorite example, like far, far away, as in last week, before we talked about testing, we talked about how we did an inverse problem of the tie G's GM plus a noise. And I brought back all the notions of variance and bias and mean square error and saying that this here, that if you can do it, if this doesn't blow up in your face, which I'm gonna blow up very soon, then what you have is the best estimate that you could find because look, it's unbiased. I didn't make the argument that it is minimum variance, but I can, I have in other times and maybe I will. Uh, so maybe I'm gonna save that though, to return to it, right? Now all we know is that this is, well, uh, look, We've already said this estimate minimizes the sum of the squared residuals. That's a super strong hint that it minimizes the variance of the estimate. Um, I'm gonna muddle it if I say more, it'll become more clear if I haven't. But anyway, so I got one way of solving this type of equations, turning a leaf. And I walk you through the necessity of doing it by talking about like the density and the moment of inertia of the earth, you know, which is physical problems that one can relate to, but they're also really just simple two by two problems where we either consider constraints independently, jointly, try to reconcile them somehow and do various things to it. Last example. No, well, how about interesting example related to what we just talked about actually. I have a bag of numbers to use and I want to conduct a linear inverse problem to the problem that says the data, if I were to you know, draw a rank against data value, the way I would do a y of x, are given by a one term, zero degree polynomial. It's a fair question. Somebody might ask you that. So here are my data. Somebody give me the GM equals D equivalent equation. Maybe I should respect my colors here. G would have been blue, as in that's the experiment, people. It's whatever you've conducted. The model parameters are unknown, but I try to find them. They're M. And we're constructing a linear inverse problem for a one term zero degree polynomial representing the data. What is G? You know, the closest equivalent I would reach for is when we last did that, except it was a little flipped. So I'm just writing, trying to write the equations that state this problem mathematically, <clears throat> the blue problem. So is a one term zero degree polynomial just like y equals x? Uh, it's, it's not y equals x in the sense that x is an independent variable. Uh, really, there isn't any more an independent variable. So it's just a constant? Yeah. So really, it's saying y equals m. Mm, it would just be all ones. Yeah, exactly. So that is the mental step. It's not even a vector. I'm just faking it with the underline here. It's just a number. The model is y equals m. Find m. And so the sensitivity matrix is just the first column of that thing. If I made a polynomial model, I would add columns with higher degrees and then I would need to say it's polynomial in an independent variable. Here, there is no independent variable and hence we have only ones. And so now I say, there's clearly an overdetermined problem. I don't even have an independent variable. So I'll draw some sort of a, well, I'll just draw a non-existent axis you know, sort of like y equals m is the relation. I gotta put them somehow. So, I don't know, here are my data. Maybe I just numbered them. Just numbered. You know, no, no connotation of anything, of any sort of independent variable. Because if there was one, it would be to the zero power. And so, there it is. Okay, so what's the solution? Well, I tell you, I know very few um, numbers or equations by heart, but this one I do know, and I do expect you to know it also, that M1 
M1 is the estimate of this kind, the linear regression, the least square solution. Well, that has to be GTG inverse times GT times D. Okay. So now look, what is G transpose? It's a row vector of ones times G, a column vector of ones inverse. What does that equate to? The GT is vector of ones, right? Yes, a row vector in this case, the G transpose is. And you multiply it by the column vector, which it is G. Okay. What does that evaluate to? A row vector of ones times a column vector of ones. That would be only one element. And what is the value of it? It's going to be depending on the ones that we have here. Yeah. Five. Is it five? Yes. Or rather, how about now? N. Inverse. I drew a proverbial five. I drew n. Okay, so that's n minus one. What's g transpose? Well, it's ones times d. There's the elements of one, so that's the sum of the elements. How many? N. Okay, so this was a game show. The question is, what is the arithmetic mean? The arithmetic mean is a least squares estimate of the one parameter that best shows up, that best represents the data. Which of course is our very definition of the location, our expectation, all these notions we've already talked about. What's now important for you to make the connection is that there are many ways of defining a location. The arithmetic mean is one way of defining the location of a point cloud, or rather a point back, a bag of points. It's the L2 way. It's the least squares way. It's all of that baggage now, putting it all together, coming together. It's a quadratic estimate, an estimate based on a quadratic quality criterion of a single parameter, non-independent variable, variable varying thing that you say, there's my data. I'm not gonna do this now, but when I write the little L's, I'm talking about norms. I talked about norm, I will talk about it later. Again, norms is measures of length. The last time we had a norm, I said, or did I? I talked about whenever we did the least squares, which is we're still doing that, nothing has changed. Correct me if I'm wrong that I have already used the words, this is a two, two norm. Have I ever said that or was that in a different light? You've never said that to my knowledge. Well, except just now, you mean. Okay, so, well, I'm gonna just say it again then here, right? So my quality criterion for coming up with that was that I minimize the sum of residuals. And the sum of residuals is just the difference between the value you think it is and the values that you have. And so you can immediately start thinking that's a uh, variant. Um, but I can find other metrics. I will find other ways of doing this. What if I try to s minimize the mean absolute deviation? I wouldn't be able to write this. It wasn't the quadratic functional. I'd get a different result. You do know what the result would be if I said, forget the least squares distance, but talk about L1, which would be the sum of the absolute values in terms of distance. That uh, will give you the median. And so I think the last, I didn't talk about norms. Okay. I talked about moments, various weighted forms of measuring things. And uh, here and until now, we've only talked about a measure of length 
as a sum of squared residuals. And when we call that phi, we did that formally, we get that. We know that this is the solution, which minimizes the difference of M and all the data points in the squared sense, which, you know, we call this epsilon squared. If we take a normalization that drops out anyway, we call this phi, you know, so by this metric, this solution minimizes that, making all sorts of sense. And so I call this now L2 with air quotes, because if I properly define it, I would include the normalization and so on. So I loosely define that now, but it's a quadratic way of measuring how wrong you are. Ergo, the arithmetic mean is just another estimate of the location of a data set in a quadratic sense. The median would be a one sense, but if you're somebody who says, could you please weight your residuals by the power of 2.7 plus pi, you would say, sure, I'll give you a location estimate of that. And all sorts of flexibility exists. And in fact, maybe it would take me too far, although actually the lecture is almost over, so maybe I can digress as much as I want because you might want to consider mixed forms of making norms and so on. Um, so maybe it is the point. How about it is the point? Let's go to remember moments. Okay, now it's the moment for norms. So let's talk about a vector X. How long is it? Well, our air quote length as in what's a measure, what's a size. I think I just made the argument that if you just take X and the values of X and you refer them to zero or to their mean, and let the mean be zero, so that I hit that at the same time. And then I'll say, well, how big is this vector? Well, the sum of squares of the vector is a measure of how big it is. It's an L2 measure with respect to zero. That's also known as a raw moment. The central moment in the L2 sense is a measure of the quadratically defined distance of the elements in the vector to their first moment. That's old hat. So now I'm just saying generically take a vector x. It's got elements x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. I'll make it a transpose so it's a column vector. And I will just say, all right, let me define the sum of the elements the pth power, am I going to do it like this? I think I am going to do it like this. And then I'm going to take the one pth root of it. Is that a symbol you do? The pth root? Yes. Like this, one to the one over pth power. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Well, I expected nothing else. Uh, notations vary and our brains only work so well. And now I'm going to claim, but verify the claim at the same time. And if you are in MATLAB and you type help norm, that it says norm VP returns the P norm of V defined as the sum of the absolute value to the dot P power to the one P power. Okay, so you're in luck because MATLAB has that good notion. So oh, what did we call these moments? Which of course had the notion of a probability, but you need to see that this is all the same stuff, right? Because if you're gonna have many entries of X repeated because of them being very probable, that's the same as doing some continuous weighting of how this particular variable occurs. I'm now looking through my notes to find where I defined the 
norms labs that's up very early moments here we are i remember this it's a moment because it's with respect to something if it's with respect to nothing it's just with respect to zero so you can think about raw versus central moments i think i briefly mentioned those terms and i didn't spend much attention but it's a moment about something and this is a moment about another point and the variance is a second moment about the first moment here and then the p the probability of x and the continuous version of it well that takes care of having an entry with multiple such occurrences and so i want you to see that that is consistent and the same thing this is a measure for a vector of discrete elements and i haven't done anything probabilistically or rather i just did by referring back to my mind anyway i call this big m for a certain moment so maybe i'm going to call this Mm, I don't know, math cal M, calligraphic, and I'll call it P. And I'm sidestepping the second parameter, which was the little M, to say, well, it's not a moment other than around the origin, and so I don't have that big problem here. Here's my definition. It gets a little box. Now I'm going to do this extend this improperly okay oh and my recollection of Menke is that he definitely talks about this in the book which you should be perusing anyway maybe i'll introduce my previous notation so i'll say that's the lp norm the l2 norm of a vector i now want you to say that that's what we have the l2 norm of a residual is what we've been minimizing. There's the least squares, there's regression, there's the first inverse, and so on. All of that baggage follows from right here. And I just showed to you that if you use the L2 norm as a measure of distance from nothing, zero, that you're asking for, where is my data? Because you get the arithmetic mean of it as the parameter that minimizes that functional over all the possible parameters. So the notion of variance is in here, in terms of the variance of the residuals, assuming they have zero mean. And the notion of mean is in there because it's the mean is the one that minimizes that measure of its residuals and so on. So I think I like why this lecture is being recorded because you know I'm just gonna write mean variance and these are my thought bubbles for you to think about what this all means, right? The mean, is the parameter about which the variance is minimized. So that's an L2 measure of location. Okay, L1 norm. Oh, and then here's my X vector, X transpose X square root. Okay, also conventionally known as the length, also written as to measure of x such that the squared length of x would be, and this is the words I just uttered, the 2 2 norm. It's just notation, right? The Euclidean length of the vector is sum and square, and then you square root it. That's the little l2 norm in my notation and definition. Squared of this inner product, notated like this with double bars. So the square of that. Is a thing without the square root. The L1 norm, I'm just going to read it, is the sum of the absolute values. It's really a measure of a size. And if I use a deviation from some unknown point in the L1 norm sense, and I ask, well, what is the point that gives me the least absolute deviation? Then uh, I end up with an L1 estimate of location. Now, disregarding the fact that you can't really do one over zero, I'm still going to do L zero, okay? That's the notion of improper here. You can't do this properly and ask for the L1 norm. But what is the L1 norm if you follow the definition? Well, it raises the element to the zero power, which means it just counts it. That's just a count. 
one measure of size of a bag of data is how many data do you have? That's N. One measure of size of a bag of vectors is by summing and squaring them. The energy, the variance, if it really has a zero mean, the two, two norm, you name it, that's all these things, that's what we've just been defining. And so if X is a residual, we've been calling this phi or phi squared. And so now I'm making the argument or other, I'm tidying up because I've made all these arguments that you, you can define the LP norm and you can work with this however you, you want. You can use that as a metric if you want. But I'll go to the L, in, L infinity norm. I was almost going to say L infinity norm because infinity sounds like I'm negating it. What is the L infinity norm of a data set of a bag of data, an X vector? So let's just read it, right? I'm gonna sum the values in absolute value by raising them to the infinite power. Now, I don't know you where and what you learned, but I do remember so well taking so many limits in math class early on, and then telling you that if you're gonna raise something to a huge power, the result even if you sum it, it's just going to be dominated by the largest power. And mm -hmm. so again, it's a bit improper here, but the L infinity norm is just a maximum of X. Does that make sense? You do series, yeah. you do limit, you know, like, I don't know, for some reasons it was a big thing in my childhood. Take some more it, limit void. Yeah. Could it be max of absolute of X instead of yeah. just X. Yes. Take absolute and thank, thank you. So it's a measure of the size of a thing. If you think about a bag of X's and now you scale the X according to the size, you're really like, you know, one good measure of it is what's the largest of it by absolute value because it's going to take the most space. Okay. I'm just going to draw this diagram here so I have it for future reference. So I want to think about how the L alpha norms see the data, or P, I call it P. Okay. It's a very useful diagram. So L2, we all know. So, and then you can think of X as, you know, think about a residual, think about the mismatch and think about how much weight you want to give it, right? Outliers under a quadratic residual are weighted quadratically, which is actually pretty bad because one outlier is really going to change your mean for that reason. Why it's not a very robust estimator of the location because our average income is whatever it is. And then Bill Gates walks into the room and suddenly our average income is, you know, $59,000 billion. Just because the addition of one outlier changes the metric so much. That's two. What is the L1 vision of reality? It's linear. And the negatives are also linear. Here's a reason why we never almost minimize L1 norms and always stick with L2 norms because look at what a nice, beautiful formula. In fact, I did it for you. I differentiated it by hand, came up with the M1 result. And that was because this thing is convex. It is easy to minimize. L1 is not shapely. What is the L0 norm? It's just giving everything, regardless of its size, a count. This diagram is going to make more sense because I'm going to add to it and return to it. But if you think of like we have a residual, a mismatch, a criterion of fit, and you summarize and you think of the L as like the phi, the thing that you minimize, and phi so far has been an L2 measure of residual misfit, and we've been doing that because it's easy. But the downside is that you're giving undue weight on not having outliers. If you have an outlier, your estimates are all going to change very much so because they're weighted quadratically. And so the word that I've used for that are robustness as in stability against outliers. And L2 estimators are not very robust 
because outliers get huge weights. And so the literature is full of people who are saying, forget L2, let's go do L1.5, or let's go do L2 until a certain point and then switch to a lower order norm because it'll give me more robustness and then you can keep going because you can design things and then you test them. So norms, moments, understand the connection here. Think of bags of vectors of a certain size, of a certain weight, how it's dominated by the number or the largest one, how if you have many of them of a certain same weight, that that's the same as saying, well, it's like weighting it by a probability. And then we go back to our moment. And how everything we've done so far in inversion is defined an L2 norm of the residual minimizer as a solution to a problem, linear inverse problem. M1 that we had is the L2 norm of the residual minimizer of a linear inverse problem. I'm writing that M hat 1, the only one solution to an inverse problem we've had is the L2 norm of the residual minimizer. It's like dash dash is the L2 norm of the residual minimizer of a linear inverse problem. That's what we mean by least squares. What is square? The residual, sir. What do you minimize? The sum of the square residual. Is that any good to find the least sum of squares residual? Well, I don't know, but I can do a test. What sort of test is going to be? It's likely to be a chi-square test because if my residuals are normally distributed, centered on zero, and they have a certain variance, which I have just minimized, I kind of know what the distribution of the residual should be. It should be, I, should, I know what the distribution of the phi's will be. It will be another chi-square. I want to say that's the story for another day, but that's the story of all the days so far. It's the same story. Maybe I'll just do it here as I went. So our phi before, it was really a phi two because it was a two norm. And if we want to think about least being good enough, we need to know the sampling distribution. And if the residual is going to be what we hope, normal and zero mean. Oh my God, this is coming so beautifully together. And these two, We'll need, and surely the phi, which is really a phi 2, built of epsilons, which are themselves Gaussian. If you normalize them properly, you are going to get a chi square variable. And that, in a nutshell, is your answer to is it good enough to have the least, well, normalized by the data variance? You should see chi squared chi-squared and you know how to interpret it. You do a test, is it good enough? And then you say, yeah, I'm done. And more about that later.